Good evening and welcome to tonight's Dallas Architecture Forum Lecture with the Distinguished Landscape Architect Michelle Delk from Snohetta. My name is Tiffany Woodson, a member of the Forum Board of Directors, and on behalf of our entire board, welcome. We are grateful that you have joined us virtually for this lecture. I'm sure we will be inspired by Michelle's presentation as she shares some of Snow Edit's amazing projects and also talks about the importance of collaboration across the design professions. Following her presentation, Forum Board Director David Hawker will have a brief conversation with Michelle, and then you will have the opportunity to submit questions for her through Zoom Q&A. Thank you again for joining us, and now I am pleased to ask Jeannie Daly to recognize this evening's sponsors and update us on the Forum's spring events. Thank you, Tiffany. We appreciate your leadership on the Forum Board. The Forum presents Michelle Delk, Partner and Director of Landscape Architecture for Snohetta. This is the Rose Family Lecture. We're thankful to Dee Dee and her late husband, Rusty, for all their contributions to the Dallas community. Thank you to our lecture season sponsors, Maharger Development, Reggie Graham, and Smink Art and Design. We're grateful to our series sponsors, Architectural Lighting Alliance, Bentley Tibbs Architect, Bodron Fruit, DLR Group Stoffelbach, Faisal Haloom Group, Headington Companies, Jackson Walker, Kafka Properties, Modern Dallas, O'Brien Architects, Perennials and Sutherland, and Scott and Cooner. Thank you to our lecture sponsors, the Adex Foundation, Boca Powell, Bonnick Landscaping, Hawker Design, and James R. Thompson. Thanks as well to our reception sponsors, Collie Partners, Landscape Forms, New Era Companies, Panoramic Doors, and Pritchard Associates. And now I'm turning it over to our forum board member, David Hawker, who will introduce our speaker. David? Thank you, Jean. I'm delighted to introduce a fellow landscape architect. I've had the pleasure of listening to Michelle speak about her connections to the landscape and her collaborative approach to the design process. Michelle Delk is a passionate champion of the public realm and serves as a partner and director of the landscape architecture for Snowetta. Michelle works to cultivate transdisciplinary collaboration for the creative advancement of the public environment. With a natural ability for engaging diverse community and client intricacies, she guides complex projects ranging from master plans and brownfield redevelopments to the realization of urban plazas, parks, streetscapes, and riverfronts. Currently, Michelle leads several efforts with Snowetta, including the design of the Willamette Falls Riverwalk in Oregon, the Blaisdell Center Master Plan in Honolulu, and the reimagined design of a significant public plaza in Midtown Manhattan. Michelle is a board member of the Urban Design Forum and speaks for influential groups around the world. For more than 30 years, Snowetta has designed some of the world's most notable public and cultural projects. Among its iconic award-winning projects are the Monumental Library of Alexandria, Egypt, the Norwegian National Opera House, and the National September 11th Memorial Museum in New York City. The firm has received many honors, including the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, the Mies van der Rohe Award, and the Wall Street Journal Innovator of the Year Award. Following her lecture, Michelle and I will have a brief conversation about important topics she covered in her presentation, and then you will be able to submit questions for Michelle through the Zoom Q&A. And now please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker, Michelle Delk. Hello, everyone. Getting everything up and going, one second. Thank you, David, and thank you to the forum for and everyone for inviting me to join you tonight. All right. So I'm going to dive in and really look at how collaboration can offer opportunity 
for innovation and design. But to begin, I'll tell you just a little bit about Snow Hat Pack. In 1989, Snohetta was founded in Norway by a small group of architects and landscape architects. Today, our firm has multiple offices in many places around the globe. Our practice has always been interested in what is possible through collaboration, and we look for opportunity to offer more than what is asked for. Collaboration really is one way we can offer generosity and make the most of the sites, the places where we are working. And as a landscape architect, when I joined Snowheda, a firm often well recognized as an architectural practice, many people ask me why. I saw in the work an incredible curiosity and a commitment to exploring the relationship between buildings and landscapes. In simple terms, this is site planning. Uh, and here you see the first project that I actually became familiar with by Snowheda. It was completed when I was in grad school. And I've always appreciated the simplicity of this structure and the relationship to the grounds. The National Opera and Ballet had become well recognized as a building perceived to blur the boundary between building and landscape, incorporating a generous civic public space that's really integral to the structure and to the site. When I joined Snowheda in 2013, projects like the renovation of Times Square were beginning construction giving space dominated by cars back to people. And the design of the Memorial Pavilion at the World Trade Center site was being developed to maintain a physical space for people to heal and remember while also looking to a new future. To be a part of a practice like Snowheda is to really commit to the potential that collaboration across disciplines has to offer. When the hierarchy that is often present in the way in which we work is set aside, there really is a possibility that the world we are working to change can be impacted in, in unforeseen and really positive ways. So for me, collaboration is at its core about optimism, how we might imagine and create something more than what may be expected or asked from us. So really, what can we do together and how can we do it? Coming together early in the design process is only worthwhile if everyone is willing and, and driven to cross boundaries, striving to be comfortable in unfamiliar territories. And this is often what we refer to as transpositioning. Each person at the table, regardless of their design discipline, must be willing to ask questions and to contribute to a collective exploration, really working to dissolve those perceived boundaries. So contrary to an overly simplistic description that we are working merely to erase the distinction between buildings and landscapes, we're actually interested in, in how ideas emerge from the site, the context, and the people we engage with along the way. And sometimes really amazing things happen. Someone else sees the potential in an idea that you might think is a little offbeat or not, not uh, relevant. And if you're willing to share it, someone else can turn it into something viable. And the most fun and the greatest successes that I've had in my career actually come from those moments. And of course, we all know that this past year has really reinforced and heightened awareness of the importance of public space as the social infrastructure of our communities. So as designers of these spaces, the need for us to consider how we can positive, positively influence health and well-being is really elevated right now. And for that, I think we need to talk about the places or the sites that we are working with, but also recognize that we as humans are social beings and that we live in a highly interconnected world. Many of us, have, many before us have called this to our attention, polymath Alexander Humboldt, beautifully described over 250 years ago, that we are part of nature as a living whole and we are bound together by a net-like fabric. And his observations demonstrate the need to recognize how our actions impact others. Collaboration allows us to make the most of the sites, the places we are working, but collaboration is challenging. It's not always pretty and it's not perfect. But I, it always really should be optimistic. Coming together, we harness the potential for innovation and creativity. So this can look like a lot of different things, and we can learn by observing any number of examples. I chose a few to share with you tonight. 
Um, these come from many others who have come together to face this challenge before us. Orville and Wilbur, one an athlete, the other a, a school dropout, together created the airplane. But what often isn't known is how hard Orville actually had to push for their work to be given shared acknowledgement, for their collaboration to be recognized. In 1981, two incredible musicians, each in their own right, David Bowie and Freddie Mercury, chose to collaborate to create one of the most critically acclaimed songs of their era, if not all time. But they've actually never performed this live together. We can also see collaboration in other places all throughout nature. Wolves uh, travel in tight knit packs and they're wonderful cooperators, yet they have very clear social rankings, compelling them to be expert communicators. Or the V formation of geese migrating long distances actually allows the leader to rotate depending on their health and their energy, adapting and sharing responsibility for the group within, within the entire group of geese. And simply sharing resources for the betterment of the whole is collaboration, evident in the biological pathways that allow trees to not only communicate, but support the, support the health of others in their community. So coming back to architecture and landscape architecture, I think we share one really clear space that holds great potential and often untapped possibilities. It's how we work with sites and with people to innovate and imagine new possibilities. So what is a site? A site can be an, as abstract as a way of thinking, such as the Snowheda Mountain that is a physical place, but represents to us the idea of a collective endeavor. And of course, sites are the places we can point at, we can visit them, and we can imagine new futures for these places. They can be composed of many things that you can't always easily see. The layers of a place embody many physical histories and many qualities. And a site can be simply a moment or a point in time that is ephemeral and often changing very rapidly. Or a site might be just one part of a much larger whole, just as we, just as, uh, we are interconnected, as Humboldt pointed out. So again, one of the most compelling spaces we share as landscape architects and architects is establishing a conceptual and physical approach to working with a site. Rather than thinking of site planning as simple organization, I think about this as the beginning of design and innovation. So I'd like to show you a few examples of, of some of our projects and the sites where we've explored these ideas and how in each project we consider site through a variety of different lenses. So as I mentioned earlier in Oslo, the National Opera and Ballet actually sits on the edge straddling terra firma and the fjord. Bjorka Fjord, uh, you see here before the opera was built. It was an active industrial waterfront in an under, underdeveloped part of Oslo. And there was a master plan developed that looked at really investing into this area. They envisioned mixed use, public spaces, even reconnecting uh, people to the water by tunneling an existing highway. And the decision to site the opera in the east side of the city really was a counterpoint to the city hall in the west. You can see that in the upper left of this image. And historically, again, the east side had had less investment and, and less social infrastructure. So the planning for the building considered how to provide connectivity and access through the site. And this, in part, led to the idea uh, to expand into the water. Uh, this was needed in order to create a site that worked for both the building program and for the surrounding area. The horizontal nature of the building worked best for the program inside, while also creating openness and invitation into, on, and through the building. So today the waterfront is vibrant with industry and commerce. You can see cruise ships in this image. The opera is uh, in the center on the right, uh, and, and this area has become really active with um, all kinds of different activity. Part of the design effort that's a little bit less easy to see actually included removal and containment of soils that were contaminated with heavy metals, improving water quality of the fjord for people, and of course, also the plants and animals that have returned. And we've done some uh, post-occupancy research to document and learn from this over time. 
We've also measured the increase of attendance to events held within the building that, that we believe through observation is in part because of the nature of invitation and openness. As well as the new civic space that's created by the sloping rooftop, which is often as active and well used as the interior of the building. Now these, uh, these young people maybe look a little bit sad, but we're pretty, pretty sure they're actually really, really excited. This was a Justin Bieber concert in 2013. <laughs> So this begins to offer a sense of collective ownership and increased access. And the engagement in the transformation of this site became a catalyst within the master plan for the whole area, offering greater connection to life in the city. Unexpected outcome, uh, of course, was the popularity of this new civic space that's uh, um, open and, and uh, welcoming to everyone. In 2018, Calgary opened their new central library, envisioned as a resource that would be welcoming to all. We felt our approach to the site also needed to think about how we might reconnect city neighborhoods and address the quality of the exterior public space in this area. And that's in part because the existing site was bisected by a light rail, uh, dividing it in half between downtown, which is to the right of this image, and the East Village, to the upper left. And today, after just a few years, the East Village has really become a vibrant uh, infill development in the city. So this area had been primarily, primarily used for parking. There was a small underutilized park space at the south end. And since this time, again, to the east, uh, it has become a much more vi vibrant, active neighborhood. But you can see on the left how that light rail divided this area. So early design discussions led us to really uncover the question about what is the opportunity to do more here? How can we make a great library and think about uh, healing this part in a uh, part of the city? That actually led us to an idea that was a little bit unusual. We said this building should have no front because that would mean it would have a back and it shouldn't turn its back on any part of the, the area. And we ended up exploring the idea of putting the entry right at the center of the building, which is also maybe a little bit unusual. That required us to ask the question, what is the landscape in this project? So integrated design thinking led us to really sculpt the ground and the building together so that we could move people up and over that light rail encapsulation, which is about 15 feet above street level. So really this land, we created a land bridge that became a passage through the building, into the building and connected a pedestrian corridor in the city. So this landscape topography of sloped walkways, gathering spaces and vegetation let, lead to that central entry to the library at the, at the um, where all of those arrows come together in this image. This creates a, a space for a 24 hour passage through the city. You can move up and over and through this building uh, at any time, as well as a convergence at the center, providing the main entry into the building, which is framed by vegetation and outdoor spaces. Public activity uh, and noise is at street level. It, it moves into the building at the lower levels. And then as you move up around the atrium, atrium of the building, it becomes more focused, quiet, and intimate. And really creating a, a, a place that is accessible in many ways, in part because there's intuitive and ease of movement. And there are a variety of public spaces inside where natural light and visibility to the outdoors is abundant. And we were able to expand the outdoor gathering areas and integrate vegetation that's inspired from and drawn from the regional characteristics. Creating informal amphitheaters as part of the fabric of the city and, and ultimately expanding the amount of outdoor public space by over three times what was planned for the site originally. So again, this opened in 2018. The first weekend, over 50,000 visitors came uh, to, to uh, visit the library and popularity has continued to increase. In Honolulu, uh, the Blaisdell Center is a collection of cultural venues owned and operated by the city. 
we were invited to create a master plan and a schematic design that proposed renovation of an existing theater and arena. Uh, the theater is the building in the foreground closest to us in this image and the arena, the circular building in the background. And we also were asked to look at the creation of new facilities and public spaces. The site has had a long and important cultural history. Visitors and locals all have personal stories about the first show that they visit, went to as a young person and events. Many, many people uh, attend their graduations here. Um, there's so many great activities that go on. And there was a feasibility study that identified the desire to preserve and renovate those two mid-century modern buildings and the landscapes associated with them. Again, this is the concert hall and, and the coconut grove that you see here. And the arena, the con which is really a concert venue today, uh, and the fish ponds that are an iconic part of the experience and the memory of those who spend time here. But this 20 acre urban campus today is really set within a sea of parking and service demands for the various venues. So our team quickly began to consider how could we address these, this service and, these service and access needs and try to begin to improve the quality of this place for everyone who visits. We wanted to better connect to the existing and new facilities while also looking for ways to improve the quality and the quantity of the outdoor public space. So we realized that by considering the site really carefully, we could significantly reduce pedestrian and car conflicts and improve safety by essentially lifting the ground plane by about 18 feet along one edge. It slopes to meet street level along the opposite edge, and we could create and cover a new highly efficient service area below an expanded public realm. This would be devoted to providing active public spaces for people rather than for cars. And the proposed site engages with all of the cultural destinations, providing a new sequence of public gardens and plazas and gathering spaces that, are, that have very minimal interruption by the vehicular movement and the service and, and really reducing those conflicts. So arriving at that idea to create a new ground plane was just the beginning. With our local partners and community members, we established a foundation around three core ideas to really give shape and character to these new public spaces. The plan proposes replacing existing fish ponds with a healthier ecosystem that surrounds much of the arena as it does today while also providing accessible and inviting passage into and through the site from the street to that upper level. New facilities and, and public areas provide gatherings, uh, gathering spaces that incorporate water in a variety of ways. Gardens manage stormwater and create beautiful and welcoming edges. Play, playful spray jets invite people to engage water and helps to cool the air. And drawing from the past cultural and agricultural history of the site, terraced water gardens cascade along woven walkways and gathering areas. Distribute, distributed throughout our destinations for cultural performances and informal places for visitors to gather and share stories and histories. So of course, remembering to maintain key aspects of the existing identity that's familiar to everyone that cherishes this place, we really hope that one day we'll see some of these ideas unfold and really provide Blaisdell Center and everyone who comes here places to create new memories and experiences. In 2015, we began working in Oregon to develop a vision plan for the Willamette Falls Riverwalk. Most recently, this is a 22 acre post-industrial site in the heart of downtown Oregon City. And for about 150 years, there has been no public access. When we first visited, we saw relics of industry. We really began to understand the three-dimensionality three of the site that's created by merging of buildings and geology over time. 
and about the hydroelectric power that's generated on site yet today. There's a little known aspect that this is the location of the first long distance transmission of electricity. They lit up street lamps in downtown Portland, which is about 20 miles away. And this power, of course, is generated um, from the energy of the second largest waterfall by volume in North America. Digging deeper, we learned of the complexity of the natural, cultural, and economic history that this site really embodies, from the connection to five confederated tribes, to this as the, the location at the end of the Oregon Trail, to the impact of incredible seasonal flooding, and much, much more. Our design approach is really about celebrating what is already here, yet sometimes forgotten. Uh, by carefully editing to sele selectively remove, repurpose, or carefully add elements to transform this waterfront into a healthy and accessible place for many years to come. We began by building on four core values that the community helped to establish, and these became design drivers. They really helped guide a vision and build consensus among stakeholders, including four government agencies, a private landowner, Portland General Electric, who maintains and operates the dam, and, and, in, and a really broad mix of stakeholders and different community members. So through outreach and a series of public meetings, uh, we were able to really begin to understand what we think of as key uses, <clears throat> excuse me, what people really want to do here. We did this while also recognizing the changing time and seasons, and the need to share space and consider each other's interests. We agreed on a couple of things really quickly and really easily, uh, that this should not just be a path that parallels the river, that this is an existing landscape composed of geology and habitat, structures, the river, the falls, it's really dynamic. And rather than focus just on the surface, that the river walk could engage the three dimensionality of the site, inviting people to move up, down, weave in and out, and really engage not only the river and the landscape, but inhabit these structures. So for example, at the center of the site today, it's been infilled with soil and a variety of different structures over time. And we've been uh, thinking about this as a way to edit, to reveal as what is already here. So historic rail tail races, for example, become restored alcove habitat. And engaging the community, we were able to determine uses and activities that helped us to transform existing structures to provide shelter and support for public space that are open and uh, weather protected. In other cases, we could just remove cladding from structures and stabilize these to re-inhabit them as part of the public realm, spaces that can tell their own cultural and historic stories. And invite people to move through a three-dimensional place that, again, is, is a mix of geology, habitat, structure, the river and the falls, and invite a variety of experiences and places for people to explore. We could introduce elements to recall what once was, while, while also having a sense of humor as we imagine a new future, such as planting a grove of trees where there was once a lumber mill. And again, working with Portland General Electric, who operates the dam still today, we really began to understand the logistics of dam maintenance and access and the needs of the site. And we could help others to understand these operation and management needs so that they could see the potential in what is already here. Interpreting existing features while respecting today's needs helps us to reveal the past and also offer new activities. And in the end, harnessing the power and the draw of the falls to really translate those four core values to create an experience that embraces all five senses recalling the many histories of this place and enjoying the complexity and the beauty of what the site is today and can be in the future. Moving to a completely different part of the country, in the small town of Decorah in Northern Iowa is Vesterheim, the National Norwegian American Immigration Museum and Heritage Center, which is kind of a mouthful, so it takes a minute to say. 
Decorah is a vibrant town of about 8,000 people, home to Luther College, a prominent liberal arts school. And yet the town has a character that's more like a small New England village. It's very different than what most people expect when they think of Iowa. Rather than soft, undulating landscape of cornfields that most might envision, Decorah is set within the driftless region of the Midwestern Plains. This is a landscape that was largely untouched by the last glacial age leaving a dramatically sculpted limestone landscape of incredible ecological diversity and variety. And this is actually an image of us kayaking the design team with the museum president and his wife on one of our last visits to the Cora. So we were asked to develop a master plan for their site and their facilities. Working closely together with the board of trustees, staff, and other stakeholders, we envisioned a future of the institution and its role in the community. The museum's history is really interesting. They began more like a natural history museum and later grew to become the largest collection of Norwegian American immigrant artifacts in North America. Many of these have been donated by Norwegian immigrants who settled throughout the area in the 1800s and since. This is also home to a folk art school where students are invited to learn directly about cultural tradition, traditions by actively participating. And what's important to, to, to us is that an institution like this is, is really unusual in a rural area. The largest city, Minneapolis, is over two and a half hour drive away. And for me, this is very personal. I know this very firsthand as I'm an Iowa native. I was born and raised about 50 miles west of Decorah. So this is working in my backyard. Investorheim is committed to sharing and expanding the immigrant story, not only of the Norwegian heritage, but they're interested in engaging visitors to understand and discuss the importance of immigration that is ongoing today throughout our nation. The museum today is a collection of buildings located along the main commercial street in town, and it also includes an open air park like area. Uh, where, the, where many original immigrant buildings are open for visitors to explore. Uh, we developed a series of site principles to establish and guide the design thinking and set shared goals. To inform the master plan in how we can address renovation of the current museum facilities, the classrooms and the office spaces, and also site and expansion that includes the creation of a central indoor public gathering space. And lastly, a more strongly integrated outdoor area and bringing the museum elements together as a unified experience. So again, you can see on the right, the outdoor space today is essentially lawn surrounding a few buildings. And we recognize that the connection and the character of the landscape is part of the immigrant story that the museum can share. And this is in part due to the familiar character of the wooded landscape found in parts of Norway, as well as the Driftless region. So as part of the park design and in contrast to the city context, we've set in motion a successional forest. This will grow to immerse visitors into a wooded landscape where glades embrace and provide home for the small buildings that are part of the museum, as well as providing spaces for programs that can be open to both visitors and city residents, including this informal amphitheater that you see in this image here, um, which is a view from the museum looking north into that heritage park. David mentioned a privately owned public space that we've been working on. This is in Midtown Manhattan, where we're currently renovating uh, the space on the right, uh, which is associated with the AT&T building uh, uh, designed and constructed in 1984 by Johnson Berge Architects. That building, if you look closely, you can see there are no lights on. It's been empty for more than three years now. And during the, our design process was landmarked um, by the city of New York, and it's one of the landmark, uh, youngest landmarks in the city. We began our thinking about the privately owned public space uh, by looking at public spaces throughout this part of Midtown Manhattan. Compared to other parts of the city, this neighborhood is, is surprisingly underserved, and many of the spaces nearby are uh, enclosed. They, they often have very minimal vegetation, and we were interested in how the transformation of this space could become a complement to others in the area. 
We were also really inspired by the verticality of Midtown. Midtown is vibrant, it's canyon-like, it's really dramatic. And nearby in Central Park, we were thinking about the history of the national, natural environment that you can see remnants of uh, the Manhattan schist, stone, the vegetation. And of course, we drew reference from the postmodern architecture. So since the uh, 1980s, the space has undergone several modifications. Most recently, the image on the right uh, shows uh, this space defined as an enclosed atrium and really acting as just a mid-block passage. Today, the space is very difficult to even identify as a public space. Any space I think that needs a sign that says public space tells you that, that maybe it needs a few more clues. Together with our client and with input from community members, we developed a plan to really change this. Today, the site is defined um, by the public space that you see in green under and around the tower itself. The space is largely covered and enclosed on the north and south. You can see the doors maybe in the plan here. The white space is uh, close to Madison or retail areas, and the white in the center is the tower lobby. At the top of this drawing is uh, a space called the Annex Building, and this is important to just take note of. This is home to truck elevators, car ramps, and other support infrastructure to service the building and, and largely to go below grade. Our proposal largely removes the annex building, retaining only what's functionally needed. And we were able to incorporate the truck elevator and those car ramps into the new garden and open the space up to the outdoors by creating a new topography up and over the car ramp and truck elevator. We can expand and embrace public gathering areas in a new garden. From the street, the garden is much more visible. It's open, it's inviting. It sort of reaches out. This elevation shows how vegetation, seating, and small retail vendors can create variety and interest in the space. And a glass canopy uh, will partly cover the central space and collect and direct rainfall into the planted zones. Plant species are drawn from the regional palette, focusing on shade tolerant and really hardy species that can provide seasonal interest and variety. And here you see a view from the south, and including a glimpse of a new window from the building lo lobby that visually connects the inside to the outside. Transforming this underutilized space into a garden that really draws upon the context and history of Midtown for workers and residents and visitors to the area. So we're currently under construction and we expect to open later next year. I have one last project to, to share with you. Last summer, we began working uh, on the co a competition for the Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library in the small town of Medora, North Dakota. You might know that Theodore Roosevelt is an avid reader, was an avid reader and explorer, and he actually spent much of his time in the Badlands, both before and during his presidency. When we first visited the future site of the library, we really began to think about how we might inv invite visitors to slow down so that they might see and feel this place as TR might have experienced it, a place that's full of intrigue and inspiration, challenge and life. We see the library of Theodore Roosevelt's life becoming a place where stories are not only told, seen and felt, but also created. During the competition, we proposed that we could envision the landscape as the library. And we've been developing a distributed library experience since that time. Now, this idea is intended to expand the library to embrace and engage not only the surrounding landscape, but also the community. Again, Medora is a small town, only about 120 people, but it's at the gateway to the National Park, to Theodore Roosevelt National Park. And many tourists arrive each year to spend time in the area. And this impacts the local housing, the economy, and the infrastructure of the park, the region, and the town. I'd like to refer to this as a, a bison traffic jam, which is uh, not an unusual experience when you visit the, the national park. The library site uh, em embodies and has been shaped by natural processes, such as erosion, flooding, the presence of fires, the grazing of the grasslands, and the many activities of people past and present. 
So to retain and improve both the ecological and the economic vitality, our team is designing an experience that is part of a land management plan. This is informed by the grazing and ranching community, our team of ecologists and community members. For example, a few weeks ago, a grassland fire threatened the community and the site. Fortunately, there was no damage to people or structures, and we can really learn from this to inform our design approach. When we first visited the site and began exploring the area, and maybe as you see here, we were trespassing just a little bit to, to get where we wanted to go. We don't really like uh, boundaries. Uh, we began to think about how the journey could really be part of the experience, while also helping to alleviate some of that uh, stresses of the visitors to the area. So rather than relying on a large parking area at the top of the bluff where the main library building will be sited, that's, that's the orange footprint, there'll be an opportunity to begin your journey in Medora, where you might leave, you might learn about the area, um, all that it has to offer, and leave your car maybe for the entire day. So here you can see two routes in white uh, that go up to the butte where the main library building will be located. What we envision is that people can hike, bike, or take a tram in the future, and visitors will be able to explore the library landscape and encounter many moments along that journey, along the exploration. Here on the crest of the bluff, you see an overlook, which is one of the many moments or destinations that we envision distributed throughout the area. And these are really intended to draw people to explore. These small moments can call attention to and help frame an understanding of the bigger picture of the Badlands and its impact and influence on Theodore Roosevelt's life and maybe on, on your life uh, as you come to visit this place. During the competition, we collected stones from around the site to help us develop ideas about a series of pavilions that could be tailored to fit into a specific space in the landscape. And actually next week we'll be spending more time on the site with our team and the client to further develop these ideas and integrate them as part of the distributed library experience. Along the journey it's not only moments like these that are compelling but visitors can also wander the trails and paths that position them in various relationships to the land itself. At the top of the bluff the main library building emerges as a moment that's set discreetly within the surrounding grasslands. Adjacent to a half mile loop boardwalk that will link to many pavilions and moments throughout the 93 acre landscape, inviting people to learn, explore, and contemplate why they're here. So, of course, we're just at the beginning of our journey and we'll continue to work with the ranchers, members of the community, and TR enthusiasts to develop this landscape as a library, a community park, and a healthy habitat. So with that, I hope I've been able to share how collaboration is not about erasing anything. It's quite the opposite. By working across design disciplines with places and people, we can really draw out latent possibilities. We can see a place through someone else's eyes. We can innovate to make the most of what is in front of us. And I, I kind of see this, that, the, in, that the, mag, the, the magic is really in the site itself. So thank you for your time today, and I will stop sharing my screen. All right. Hey, Michelle. Hi, David. Yeah. Hey, uh, wow. Awesome. The uh, incredibly complex and beautiful projects, as, as always, they're incredibly impactful for the, the sites that you guys are dealing with. So always inspiring. Um, the forum's obviously very grateful for your time and inspirational talk. And I selfishly am always glad when uh, fellow professional landscape architects sort of have a, a really great contribution um, for sort of a talking platform. So well, thank again, you. Thank, thank you very you. much. So I'm very pleased that you actually ended with um, the project and congratulations for getting that because the competition I believe was probably pretty stiff. There was some really solid entries, but um, Absolutely. what you guys put forth, it was, was very beautiful. And unless I'm mistaken, I mean, that is a perfect sort of project that you guys uh, collaborated on internally so i think that was very um a uh, perfect way to sort of end the talk but um 
I do have to pull this back shortly. So we talked a little bit before, you know, and I, I made some notes on some some questions I wanted to ask, and I'm not sure Nate at some point will kick us off and, and have to start some Q and A. But um, what really are what are those challenges, right, with collaborative efforts? You know, it was sort of posed as a question, right, and we all know that collaboration with any professional discipline can have its moments because at the end of the day, we're here to solve problems. We're sort of part of a team, but yeah. you and I discussed a little bit last week um, about even just sort of architects and landscape architects and some of the, the challenges we face as we really try to come together and sort of create these holistic ideas. So I was hoping you could elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. I mean, there, there are a couple of things that come to mind that, that are, are they sound really simple, but I think they require a lot of work and a lot of thought. And 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 I, I think it's really worth the effort. Um, one is one is the the simple idea of coming together early around a table. And and I, I think there's often um, a lot of pressures on all of us to you know manage our time really carefully or to really have a defined agenda and know what your outcomes are going to be and one thing i've really found especially in my my past several years working with snowheda is is coming around the table with an i you know the the idea that you're going to create ideas together uh, and really kind of letting go of you know what your disciplinary background is um, how many years of experience you have means that you can start to ask questions and really see something through someone else's eyes. And it's very hard to do that when you bring someone in late to the process, when you say, I have this idea and I've got it started and now I need you to make it better, or now I need you to solve a problem that I have. Mm -hmm. we, you know, we're all, as you said, David, like happy to, and, and we're in this to, to creatively solve problems. But that creativity, I think, really begins with that that platform at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I, I think it's it's it sounds so simple, but I think it's easy to forget. I think it can be uncomfortable. So, I, I think earlier today I actually said we we need to be comfortable being uncomfortable. <laughs> Um, the other thing I think we might have talked about briefly is is actually like, like language and vocabulary. Yes, and, right. And like and what we're sort of infused with and brought into sort of the profession, maybe knowing or thinking we know it. We speak very different languages sometimes. We do, we do, and 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 that's what makes us as different disciplines really special. So, so in my view. We want to come together and work together, learn from each other and share. But what we don't want to do is, is ignore the unique points of view and the unique knowledge and, and ideas that we have because we each chose the, a profession to be in. So, so right. that means we kind of see the world in a certain way. We're drawn to it certain, in a certain way. And if, if we hide that or we try to pretend like there aren't distinctions, I think we're losing actually the power. So, so I think part of it is trying to learn each other's vocabulary. Like I've been in more conversations and, and been able to learn to contribute to discussions about building massing, about the design of a facade, about all mm. kinds of aspects of, of something that architects are thinking about that as a landscape architect, I would have been really in the past really uncomfortable with. So you have to listen and learn and ask questions and say, well, you know, I don't know that much about that, but this is something that I'm seeing or feeling and vice versa that, you know, David, right? Landscape, it, what is landscape? It's, it's a right. million different things. And sometimes people say, I think I shared with you, sometimes people will say to me, not so much anymore, but they say, I really want to talk to you about the landscape of this project and I would just start talking about oh I don't know like the wind or uh, the topography right. and they look kind of confused and then they, I'd, mm -hmm. I'd say well you know what what's up and they say well I was actually asking you about the plants <laughs> yeah. so so it's right. it's like all of us learning that 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 we need to say what we mean <laughs> <laughs> when I think too, when you can even strip down some of these initial conversations and they really have very little to absolutely nothing to do with design, right? You're even talking about, you know, what's happening on a site, you know, how are we going to protect this, this sort of fragile ecosystem, et cetera. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree with you. I've, I'm like a sponge. I don't, I don't 
whatever the, the sort of topic of discussion is, you know, I've sat through so many meetings where, you know, everybody's talking about glazing. I mean, you, you understand and start to really um, uh, start to gain a new sort of vocabulary as well if you're open to understanding both disciplines, especially with structural engineers too. I mean, everybody at the table, as you said, is, yeah. the sooner we can all sort of be there discussing initial ideas and concepts, it, it just creates a much more holistic and better project. It's those projects, much like many of the ones you show, like a lot of us might reference with our own sort of, um, uh, you know, recall, or it's those places that feel effortless and, mm -hmm. you know, are just, you know, great places to be. So it's good to hear that even, you know, within your, your firm that, that you have some of the same challenges we all do, whether we're in a multidisciplinary firm or, or even just sort of individual practitioners. Yeah. Um, one interesting thing that I had sort of made a note on, and, and it maybe is even more relevant because uh, Snowetta is multidisciplinary, but, you know, even we've even gone after projects with you as well, right? So we've all tried to sort of collaborate and go after yeah. projects um, as landscape architects. Um, within uh, Snowetta or even your experience sort of in, in general, um, you know, do you have an opinion or who should the client really even come to first? Because we start to see now where it's traditionally not always architect is prime or architect is the first one to the table. Many times it's the landscape architect sort of building these teams. How does that work uh, within sort of your firm structure? Because I know you guys have landscape specific problem projects, you have architecture specific, and then you have sort of combined efforts as well. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, 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 um, not not dissimilar to to how others work. I mean, even with within our own practice, it, we we identify, of course, someone needs to lead and internally, right? Someone needs to lead. We need to build a team, and we need to make sure that team has the right mix and blending of expertise. Um, you know, a couple things that we do that I I think really, I guess set the set the table so that that collaboration begins at the beginning is that no matter what type of project it is we we make sure that our teams engage at a minimum architects and landscapes and landscape architects internally we also have interior architects um, hmm. uh, in in the us that's really the the disciplines that we have in some of our other studios around the world we have graphics and branding designers we have um, uh, product designers and others, and so we sometimes reach out depending on you know the scope or the question at hand. But I think what we find is that that at a, at a minimum, think, pe having at the table people thinking about architecture and landscape architecture at the same time, again, just kind of sets in motion of way of thinking. I really, for me, Calgary Library was. Uh, really one of the first projects when I joined Snowheada that I was, you know, at the table and, and experienced that firsthand. And I genuinely believe that um, that solution that we came up with came out of the somebody putting uh, something on the table, uh, you know, and say, and then someone else saying, yeah, we could do that. Like, like saying, well, can we put the entry at the center of the building? I know mm -hmm. that sounds a little crazy and that's not normally what you would do. And then, and then as, as people who can think about the program of the building and the way it needs to operate and the mass and scale, talking to landscape architects who are saying, well, I, I think I can get us up and over a light rail that's 15 feet right. the street. The, it, that it's literally that back and forth. So we form our teams so that you, you have that in place. And then we try to be sure that, um, you know, all of the other experts and all the other people that we need to have informing that, that thinking mm -hmm. are, are there and participating, whether that's the client themselves who often is at the table with us during those sessions or, um, mm -hmm. you know, artists and ecologists and engineers. Right. I mean, that project is, and I remember when, I, I believe I've heard you speak on that one before as well, but it is such a perfect example. Maybe it's one of those projects that when you're there, it's just like, oh yeah, of course, this is the solution, right? Of course but that's what we need. It was, it was an incredibly complex discussion and collaboration just to get to that point, right? But it feels so effortless and, and just for this fantastic solution. But I also think it stretches sort of the 
the idea of what's landscape and sort of the, the urban fabric and building all just become this really one articulated beautiful solution. So again, sort of a great example of where everybody was firing on all cylinders and collaborating, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but you, you mentioned one thing there that was kind of my last point was, you know, with regards to clients and, you know, we've all had a whole sundry sort of different types of clients, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always kind of look at how can the client really encourage um, and facilitate very productive collaboration? Because sometimes it's the opposite effect. They can sort of uh, go straight to the top, if you will, right? And then there's sort of this weird filtering of information. So you, you understand when you have great projects, um, where everybody is at the table, but if there's any sort of advice or sort of discussion on that. <laughs> I think what I could say is I have been known to, you know, have to elbow my way in uh, because sometimes, <laughs> sometimes clients yeah. <laughs> have an idea of how they need to do this and how it needs to start, um, you know, a process. Um, and they may not see at first the, opportunity that's provided by having mm -hmm. people who are thinking about site and landscape in conjunction mm -hmm. with architecture. So, you know, the, the great fortune of being at a firm like Snowheda is that mm -hmm. people often come to us because they know that about us. So we right. kind of have a, uh, I think, not that it's always easy or always the case, but we have that platform to at least start and say, look, this is how we work. And we're, you're not going to get that building you're referencing if you don't allow us to work in this way. And so I guess my advice would be, you know, building those relationships um, with people outside of our own practices that when you, when you pursue a project or when a client comes to you, you're able to say like, no, this is really important to us. And, and, and you're not going to get what you want if you don't let us to work, work the way that we want to. <laughs> but man, I haven't, I've had to be louder than I, I uh, it's a, it's the, it's the TR policy, right? Your big stick policy, <laughs> speak softly, carry a big stick, right? That's right. Well, <laughs> well, well, your way to the front of the table. So uh, <laughs> if any audience members have questions for Michelle or David, uh, just put them in the Zoom Q&A and we'll take those. And while we're waiting for a couple, I'll start off with one, Michelle. So I know Snowhead is a big firm and you're around the world, but you still really try to be a family. And I think Pre-pandemic, you got basically everyone together at least once a year for like a big kind of family celebration. So I'm assuming that didn't happen because of the pandemic. Have you rescheduled it for this coming year? Oh, gosh. Um, I don't know if it's been rescheduled. You're right. Like it, the, 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 there is a, um, it's, it's generally every other year now because um, oh, okay. as we've grown, it's become, it, we have grown to be, I, you know, Around the world, I, I think we're maybe around 250 people in the in the U.S. In New York, San Francisco, we're at about 95 right now. So that growth has affected how you can get together. But for those who don't know, um, you know, pretty regularly, anyone who wants to, you don't have to, but anyone who wants to from the firm goes and hikes the Snowhead Mountain. So that was that first image that was on my my screen when we started was the the hike up the mountain. That's great. <laughs> so we have a question. The question is from Jessica it says, as a fellow Plain State Midwesterner, I wonder if you can speak to the ways in which the interconnectedness and familiarity of the smaller community informs the collaborative process, especially with respect to the community direct side of the land. And she's thinking about Oregon, Iowa, and North Dakota projects. So yeah, how yeah. do you that interconnectedness to the land? Um, well, uh, I, I, I love the question. Um, I'm not, hopefully I'm going to answer it. I will do my best. I mean, I think that something that's been really um, impactful to me is actually just using the, the TR library because that's what we're, we're you know, really, you know, it's fresh. Um, I was able to, when we started the competition last summer, I was able to drive because I'm currently in Colorado. And so I was actually able to drive to North Dakota to the site. It's a, it's about a, I don't know, 10 hour drive. And, and the reason I mentioned that is that, and, 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 and some of my colleagues flew from different places. And so we did go to the site. It was, it was, a, it was challenging during uh, the last year, but we were able to go a couple of times. And for me, um, I was, I really, really appreciated actually that sequence, that, that, that journey from Colorado 
through Wyoming, South Dakota, and to North Dakota, and seeing the landscape unfold, and 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 stopping along the way, and just remembering. I think when we work in places where we don't live, uh, it takes a lot of intention to immerse yourself and remember to pay attention, talk to people, look at what's going on, how are things constructed, observe the land and the place. And, you know, most of the time I'm living in, in New York City in Brooklyn in a very dense active place. And I, I feel really fortunate that I was able to drive, slow down and take that in. And we've, we've really spent a lot of time talking to people in that community, getting to know them directly. And, and we really try to do that in, in all of the places where we're working, uh, especially when we're not, it's not our home. And, and actually to, to David's point, uh, we, we often partner with people who have firms in those places because we want to um, sort of merge, we want to mind melt with them. We want to bring, we want to bring our own, you know, perspectives and expertise that every person has, every individual has our own stories, our own experiences that frame how we see things. And then we kind of want to mind meld, like, you know, David and I want to mind meld and like get the best of both worlds. <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, next question. What do you see as critical issues and opportunities in American cities from a planning and landscape standpoint? Critical issues and opportunities. Um, well, I think it's. I think it's. Um, you know, for me, uh, really about health, about the health of people and the health of our environment. And and what I kind of mentioned uh, briefly at the beginning of the presentation about interconnectedness. And I often refer to it as social infrastructure, that the places that we're making are the places where we live our lives and where we build connections. And those connections are interpersonal, right? It's with, uh, you know, between people, but connecting through a, an under, building an understanding of, for lack of a better word at the moment, the larger landscape, the world that we're living in, understanding that there's cause and effect, um, I think is a really, big opportunity and a really big challenge. And I think, you know, if there are, if there are, if there's an optimistic way to look at the past year or so that we've been living, it's to, to, to see that that's been elevated and that we are maybe appreciating and understanding that more, that the health of the, the habitat that we're sharing with other, you know, plants, animals, and creatures is, 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 is part of the health of our own human ecosystem too. So I think those are the big issues yeah. for me. You talked about some projects for collaboration is at least uh, worked well or is working well. So a question from another viewer is, uh, talk about a project where let's say there was a bit of a struggle or maybe this wasn't a project outcome, but a learning outcome. So for, <laughs> I guess a, a challenging collaboration or kind of like- A challenging, oh, oh gosh, I think they all are. <laughs> Um, let me see. Um, you don't have oh, to say that. It can be anonymous. <laughs> that's, no, it's tough. It's, I think there's just, there's always moments. It's, I mean, that's why I, I, I put the slide up that said collaboration is easy question mark because I, I, I really, it's a word that's used a lot right now. And I think it's, it's something that many, if not most people are really interested in, but I, I, I think that it's a mistake to think that it's easy um, or maybe even natural sometimes. I mean, there's something to be said for like finding the moments when you need your own quiet space and you need to think and you need to do on your own and then coming back together to collaborate, to share, to build ideas and to be open to someone else. To me, every, there, there are, moments where it sort of just seems to fall into place, where there's easy synergy, all in one project, <laughs> uh, or maybe one day. <laughs> and there are moments where it's really hard, where you're not, you don't feel like you're being heard, or you're not communicating, or, so I don't know. Um, I, I can't, I mean, I, I can't think of one project. I think that there, I mean, I think it's honest to say that it's always hard. Yeah. Um, I mean, this last year has been challenging for all of us. And um, so you talked about recharging. So I guess, I mean, one hopefully good out, 
outcome of this pandemic is that people recognize the importance of nature and being connected and you know spaces and so what how do you what, recharge yourself i mean how, kind of what do you do to recharge me personally oh yeah um well <laughs> this is <laughs> going to be surprising to you all i spend a lot of time outside <laughs> <laughs> um maybe one thing i can i mean i but seriously i i mean i i love walking i love walking in the mountains i love walking on the beach i love walking through my neighborhood to me, it, that that is a way to sort of quietly clear my mind and call attention to the world around me. I, I have a tendency to not want to take the same path anywhere that I go, even if I'm going somewhere every day. I meander, I move in different ways because I want to see the world around me and not be in my head so much. So Zoom world has been really, really hard. Um, but I'll also share that um, I, I, um, because I am in Colorado right now where I, I lived um, before in New York um, and split my time, mo most of the time I split time between New York and Denver. Um, I have a sailboat at 9,000 feet at a lake in the mountains and I love to go sailing. And the minute I like walk onto that dock, it's like everything just kind of falls away. Well, Michelle, thank you for expanding our vision, for sharing these amazing projects, the importance of collaboration. David, thank you for your conversation contributions also. Mm -hmm. uh, we really appreciate all Snowhead is doing and all that you're doing. And again, it's been great. So thank you so much. I'm happy thank you. Talk. Thank, thank you, so you for letting me share. Oh, no, yeah, here. Thank fantastic. you for joining us. Yeah, David, Michelle, all of you. Good night. Hope to see many of you next Tuesday for the panel. And in the meantime, take care. And thanks again. Good night. All right.